Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I will be talking tonight, as is obvious, about rocket science and if it's hard, uh, how hard can it be? And uh, my assistant here, Mr. Sayandeep Sean Khan, he will later speak about some meteorological experiments. <clears throat> I myself, I'm a physicist, an astrophysicist, and uh, the work we do in rocket science in the FIR is uh, purely amateur rocketry, as you would call it. We are not pursuing any financial gains. We are just doing it because we want to do it. We want to know what is going on with this. Okay, so what is rocket science? It may be something that is really complicated to understand and to learn. That's what they all say. Oh, no, it's not rocket science. It's just a synonym for saying that's really easy. So in reality, it's to design build and fly rockets, of course. And that's what we do. And if you do it more sophisticatedly, with a lot of money, we call it aerospace engineering. So, why would you do that? I mean, it's a lot of time and money and resources, you think. Yeah, why do it? Yeah, maybe you're just curious. Can we do it? Is it possible? That was what had driven the first pioneers, because it was totally unknown if you could reach space using a rocket at first. Then, of course, there's uh, this main driver behind this uh, rocket science, which is technology, where you want to achieve something, like project something on somebody else. You know what I mean. And uh, for me as a scientist, as a physicist, it's very interesting to see all these space-borne instruments giving us data that were not achievable from the ground, especially in the infrared. And for philosophers, it's just a treasure growth, thinking about the vastness of space and what it means for us as human beings. So, of course, if you can get to space, why not travel? Why don't not go to other places in our solar system, like other planets, asteroids, or comets? Uh, you all have heard about uh, the lander Philae that has landed last month on uh, churyumov gerasimenko 67 p And I can say this name very well because I've been working on this project. And right now, I'm very proud to say that, this lander that has touched down on the comet has my, my name on it. <clears throat> so, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so, space travel leads immediately to exploration. So there are the spaces, locations around the solar system or even beyond that we would like to go to and explore, that is, look at it, measure in, the, in there, in situ, or bring back stuff to measure it here. And of course, if you do this for a long time, maybe in the future we can do colonization. So we can go there to stay and to survive on the long run. So these can be your motivations. Maybe you have another. Tell me. Yeah? If you find something else, I would be interested. So, motivation. Now let's uh, come to the three modern rocket scientists. There were, in ancient times, Chinese rocket scientists. They're not well known, but they were there. But they were not very successful. It's a long story, but today we'll talk about the three rocketeers, as I call them, which is uh, the first one is Konstantin Eduardovich Tsiolkovsky, who lived uh, from the 1860s to 1935. And he was a poor guy because in the age of 10, when he was playing outside in Russian winter, he got scarlet fever and it left him almost deaf. So all his life he was, uh, yeah, deaf, almost. So he became a bibliophilic autodidact because he had to drop out of school with 14 because the teacher couldn't get through to him. I mean, yelling all the time at a pupil is very difficult for the teacher also. So he started to read a lot by himself. And he went to Moscow uh, in a library where he met a philosopher called Fyodorov. And he taught him a lot of things. And he read Jules Verne, especially these uh, two little stories called From the Earth to the Moon and the other one Around the Moon, which is a story about three men being shot by a cannon to the moon and going around. It's the first uh, science fiction story that uh, talks about lunar voyages, and it inspired him. Very fast he understood that it was not possible this way, anyway. So he became a mathematics and physics teacher, even death, and he was tolerated by his environment, meaning that he ran around, mumbled something, and said, ah, it's the old crook, no problem, let him, let him talk. Yeah, no, nobody understood what he was talking about. He did aerodynamic experiments in wind tunnels, so he built them by himself, and he developed something that we would call today a Zeppelin, a full metal, uh, but uh, the Russians didn't understand it. They didn't get it. The authorities wouldn't help him. 
And he became a philosopher in a branch that is today called Cosmism. Very interesting branch. If you want, read it up. So the second one is Robert Hutchington Goddard. And he lived a little later than Tsiolkovsky. Unfortunately, he died very young due to cancer. And he had also a very fragile health, which led to voracious reading. And he was inspired by H.G. Wells. I'm pretty sure he also read Jules Verne, but we know from his uh, diary that he was especially impressed by H.G. Wells. Mm, he became a physics professor, which give, gave him some uh, autonomy and funding. But during his lifetime, he was ridiculed by newspapers, especially by the New York Times. And when Apollo 11 landed on the moon the same day, they for, for the first time apologized in uh, the New York Times for being so bad to Mr. Goddard. He invented and flew the first liquid-propelled rocket, the first that this Earth has ever seen. And believe it or not, since 1930, he had a workshop in Roswell, New Mexico. Yeah, I can change it. It's the way it is. And he was sponsored by Mr. Guggenheim. And in the end of his life, he accumulated more than 200 patents that were important for rocketry. That's a number. Anyway, the third one, closer to home, Mr. Hermann Julius Obert. He was also inspired by Jules Verne. And his father, he was a, a medic, a chirurg. He wanted him to study medicine. So he went to study medicine, but then World War I broke out, and he got wounded in 1915 in carpets. And when he saw all this blood and, and, and everything, he saw, no, I cannot, I, I, I can't continue medicine. It's not possible. So he switched to physics, math, and astronomy, which has much less blood. <laughs> and he became a physics, math, and chemistry teacher and a gymnasium. But he was very restless and started to think about rockets. And his ideas that he put forward in the early 1920s were violently opposed by so-called scientists that said what he was thinking about was totally utopian and not possible, and he was a total loon. Anyway, he developed the first German liquid rocket engine just a few years later, 1930, it was the first test, together with his pupil Werner von Braun, that some of you may know. And interestingly enough, he was a philosopher and parapsychologist. Oh, yes. So, now a few important points in the lives of these three rocketeers that we know of. And one that we know of very precisely because he kept a very nice diary is Goddard's Epiphany, sitting on a charity on the 19th of October of 1899. He has just read H.G. E. Wells' War of the Worlds and had some chores to do outside, and instead of doing the chores, he went on a charity where he thought about, and he said that it was one of the quiet, colorful afternoons of sheer beauty, which we have in October, in New England, and as I looked towards the fields at the east, I imagined how wonderful it would be to make some device which had even the possibility of ascending to Mars, and how it would look on a small scale if sent up from the meadow at my feet. I was a different boy when I descended the tree from when I ascended, for existence at least seemed very purposive. So here we have a clear case where a single moment in life changes everything for this man. Then, <clears throat> another very important point, this time for Mr. Tsiolkovsky, was the first publication called The Exploration of Cosmic Spains by Means of Reactive Devices, also known as rockets. Um, this image you see here, it's an early sketch, it's not from the book. He had a refined version there, but it's very difficult to get the book because it's in Russian and you don't get it in digital from easily. So he said in this book that space travel is feasible, which was totally preposterous at that time. Recall propulsion is needed to move in vacuum, so he had it figured out. Gunpowder is not energetic enough for propulsion, and remember that since the 12th century, every single rocket that I know of had been built with gunpowder. And he said, but there are liquids sufficiently energetic, so there is a loophole. Uh, even if gunpowder is not good enough, there are other liquids that can do it. And he also named them. For example, liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen would be an ideal propellant combination. And this is very interesting because liquid hydrogen had been synthesized only a few years before in small quantities. And he was thinking about burning it in tons and tons of stuff, where one kilo would cost like 
a million euros, okay? So he was way, way ahead of his time. And as is the case with uh, such pioneers, nobody understood what he had written in this uh, treatise. Well, anyway, 20 years passed, and Mr. Obert published a book. First, he tried to write a dissertation in Göttingen, where he was studying astrophysics, astronomy it was called in that day. And he called it Rocket to Planetary Spaces, Die Rakete zu den Planetenräumen. And his professor, Mr. Wachswolf, said, well, it seems all quite well, but it has nothing to do with astronomy. So, no, I cannot pass this dissertation. So he went on and published it as a book, and later on got a diploma thesis for this book. And this book was read throughout Germany and uh, spread to other parts of the world. And in the end, this book made that these three rocketeers knew each other. So what did he write in this book? It is possible to build a device that can go beyond the atmosphere. It's very similar to what Tsiolkovsky found 20 years earlier. These devices will reach velocities to leave Earth's gravity well. Again, preposterous. And such devices will be able to transport humans. Impossible. So, and this was uh, the real important prophecy, the realization of these devices will be feasible in the next decades. This is quite well, knowing that we landed on the moon like 46 years later. So, another very important point was Goddard's invention of liquid propulsion. The first flight was on 16th of March of 1926. And he used gasoline and liquid oxygen. The tank, indeed, was below the burning chamber, totally atypical to today's design. So the burning chamber is this little black thing up there. And then we have uh, the, Laval nozzle, the Laval nozzle here, which was totally new, which wasn't used before. Uh, it, pays out to be physics professor sometimes. And uh, it has a specific impulse of about 170, which is almost a double of gunpowder. Not very good compared to modern uh, engines. But anyway, he only reached 56 meters, and it lasted 2.5 seconds to reach this height. Well, unfortunately, there was a camera running, but before the rocket could lift off, uh, yeah, the film was empty. So no movie. <laughs> You, you know that moment, right? You, you really get something right, and then, no, sorry, but you didn't press the button. Ah. Okay, that happened to Mr. Goddard, too, so. Okay, let's talk about foundations. What do we need to make rocketry, to be a rocket scientist? Of course, mathematics. And mathematics is everywhere, I don't have to tell you. Linear equations, algebraic equations, differential equations, calculus, integration, everything else, and some specialized things, too. So mathematics is... Very basic. Then, of course, physics. Although we don't need very sophisticated physics, just a classical one. So classical mechanics, classical gravitational theory, of course. If you get close to planets and moons, maybe you need some extension of the normal point-like theory. But this is not really complicated. Then, and this is for the pyromaniacs here, we need thermodynamics, because this is a theory of combustion. Yeah? So combustion is today very important, especially for high-thrust engines. And this is almost, I mean, everybody knows this. Yeah? We have the burning chamber here where the combustion takes place. And then there's this bell-like, bell-shaped nozzle that expands the gas. And by expanding the gas, transforms the inner energy into kinetic energy of the gas, thereby propelling the rocket in the other direction. Then, of course, aerodynamics, at, at least as long as you stay within the atmosphere, this is very important because this is the main force on the rocket. Yeah? Uh, if you have seen rocket launches, there's always this point of max Q. Max Q means that the rocket is at the point where the most forces is acting on it. It's very dangerous at the point, and after that, it gets down. So aerodynamics, very important. Very complicated, too. Orbital mechanics, once you reach space, you will have to understand very, very good where you are and where you're going. So orbital mechanics and maneuvering. Otherwise, you won't reach the target you intend. This is, for example, uh, the trajectories of uh, Voyager 1 and 2, which was really pure luck to get so many planets in one shot. Now you have to launch it at the right time, otherwise it's not possible. Then you need a lot of mechanical engineering. So this is today much easier than it was like 40 years ago. We have today CAD CAM, we have CNC milling machines and LAS and everything. So much easier and much easier to reproduce, especially because our materials today 
are more, um, yeah. If they say it's aluminum, it's aluminum. It's not just some crap. Yeah. So we need a lot of metal working, yeah, milling, milling, drilling, whatever. And this is coming now more into focus. You will use composite materials if you need a lightweight structure that is sturdy enough. It's more complicated than, than, than cutting metal, but it's really lightweight. It pays off. Then, of course, electronics. Everything that will fly on a rocket will have to be very light and consume not too much energy. Otherwise, the batteries will be too big. This is prohibitive. I mean, we are not in the Apollo era anymore. We don't need hundreds or thousands of watts to run a computer. And, and this I don't have to tell you, we need a lot of software today. In the beginning, the first rockets were launched without digital computers, they were launched with analog computers, so-called Mischgerät was the first of them, and there was not one single line of code, remember that. They flew the first rockets with that until the Apollo program. The Apollo program was the first one that really used digital technology. And very important, once the rocket is gone, and normally they are gone very, very fast, the only way to get your data is through telemetry. No other way around. Okay, now let's see how rocketry works. The principle of every rocket is the so-called recoil principle. That states, and this is a direct uh, result from the homogeneity of space, Noether theorem, the total momentum of a closed system appears constant for an inertial observer. Or with Newton, if there are no forces, the total momentum doesn't change. So if you look at a rocket at a certain time, and the next moment, it expels a little bit of mass with a relative velocity u. So this is the velocity minus u in relation of the center of gravity of the rest of the system. Yeah, so you go from here to there. Of course, it's a continuous, but just think about atoms flying away. So anyway, if you say that this is conserved, then the total momentum in this moment has to be equal to the total momentum in this moment, and this leads to the simple equation. I know equations make people run away. This one. And if you look at it very, very closely, you see it's much easier. It's this one. So, if you divide it by the time, delta t b, you get a differential equation that can you integrate, yada, 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 and you get to Tsiolkovsky's formula. He found that in 1800-something, so it's not complicated at all, yeah? <laughs> no, no, really. <laughs> it's not wrong. <clears throat> it's wrong. Okay. <laughs> so... Well, th this thing that I call delta V that stands here. This, this is the only thing that you really have to remember. Delta V is somehow proportional to this expulsion velocity and some logarithmic of the ratio of beginning and end mass, okay? So, this one here is technologically given by the engine you have. This is a velocity given by gas expulsion, for example. It's in the order of between 1,000 meters per second to a maximum of 5,000 meters per second. If you use electric engines, you can go much higher, but with, with chemistry, you are bound to this expulsion. And the second term here, the lighter the rocket gets after the burn, the higher the total term gets, but because of the logarithm, the effect is very small. But anyway, you will try it. So what, what do we need delta V for? Uh, you need it to get from one place in our solar system to another, because to get from one orbit to another, you need a certain delta V. Who of you plays Kerbal Space Program? Ah, okay, so, <laughs> very good, very good, yeah. My little son does too. Mm, my wife doesn't like it. Anyway, <laughs> so, to get from the Earth to low Earth orbit, you need an exorbitant amount of up to 10 kilometers per second. That's why it's so complicated to get off the Earth. Once you are on low Earth orbit, it's relatively cheap to get to other, let's say, to geotransfer orbit is 2.5, so only one-fourth. Yeah, and from there to Mars, it's just adding up these ones. It's not that much, okay, it's, it's still something, but not that much as going from the Earth to low Earth orbit. So getting to low Earth orbit is the real challenge. Once you are there, you have all the time in the world. You can use a very, very little engine, this is just very efficient, and you get where you want, okay? But getting to low Earth orbit, this is, this is the lesson you have to learn, that's complicated. Okay, to get there, normally one stage is not enough. 
So you use two or several stages, and then just this delta V just adds up. Yeah, so this is the first stage, and you start with the mass M0, and at the end of the burn you have the mass M1, and then the next stage you start with M1, and the rest is M2, and this has to be as large as possible. So you spend every time a lot of mass, and that's why a Saturn V rocket looks very big at the beginning and very small at the end. Okay, so now let's talk about our projects. Why would we even do that? So for our case, for the FIR, we want to make testing on suborbital flights. And we kind of got into orbit now, it's impossible with the resources we have, but we can test it on suborbital flights. It means we just fly to, let's say, 10 kilometers or even only two kilometers, and then we can test all the stuff that is needed for a real flight, like telemetry, avionics, uh, everything. Yeah? It, it doesn't change, it's just a bigger rocket in the end. Then, even if you do only go to a few kilometers of height, you have almost minutes of zero or microgravity. So you can do really interesting experiments without going into space. And what we really want to do is cross the Kármán line, because at that moment, the Kármán line is at 100 kilometers. It's just a definition. There's no real line there. You can go up there and look. There's nothing. Anyway. <laughs> One day we just thought, okay, when are we in space? It is 60 kilometers? No, it's 80, uh, 120, mm, let's take a round number. Let's take 100 kilometers, and that's the Kármán line. Uh, normally you say Kármán line is defined by, there is no, there is no possibility that a, that a plane can stay up there. You need a rocket. So, and what is very important too is meteorological in situ measurements, and there I want to switch to my colleague, Sean, because he is the meteorologist. And the mic? Yeah, mic. Thank you, David. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. So while David has already mentioned that rockets are one of the possible means to access the interplanetary space, and you can do some kind of science in interplanetary space, we can also do some really interesting science without going to the interplanetary space, up to a height of maybe 8 to 10 kilometers, that is the upper limits of the troposphere. In fact, you do not even have to go to 10 kilometers, you just go to 5 kilometers and you can do really interesting stuff. Let us take a look what we can do there. Look at this, does not? Yep. Good on. So, here I have quoted a line from a paper from Van der Lai Martins, and this paper was published in the Atmospheric Chemistry and Physics Journal, which is an open, open access journal from the European Geological Union. And there he writes that, unfortunately, all the methods that we have today, including today's radio sondes, including today's satellites and radar methods, they are not enough to study, for example, a cloud. Particularly, he emphasizes that the thermodynamics that is happening in the top part of the cloud which is illuminated by the solar radiation, is entirely different than what is happening in the bottom side or the side parts of the cloud, which is not illuminated. And thereby, you have entirely different thermodynamic phases, entirely different dynamics of water vapor condensating and again, again, vaporizing. And this can have really deciding effects on uh, the climate system of this planet. Why this is important for us? Because if any one of you have read the report of IPCC, the last one and the one before that, you will see that the surety that we have on our knowledge about aerosol systems, more specifically on clouds, is really, really low. If you want a quantification, then the amount of error is in the order of 300%. And therefore, uh, investigating aerosol systems, or more specifically, investigating clouds, and the indirect effects, how they influence the albedo of the planet, is really important in order to predict what the planet is going to look like in the next years or in the next decades, and how the climate system is going to be affected by that. Why? Rockets make a very interesting and a very perfect way of investigating that will be cleared from this picture, this is an investigation done by NASA. This is called Greece as the country of Greece, but this stands for ground to rocket electrical something uh, correlation experiment. And how, how it, what you can see here is that a rocket is delivering a sonde directly inside an aura. So the 
Important part here is that a rocket can do really precise sonder delivery, really precise instrument delivery. And this is why this is really interesting. Then we can del deliver a device on the top of the cloud or even on the bottom of the cloud. And then we can use these two devices to investigate what has not been investigated yet. In order to do that, we do not need really big rockets. First, let us take a look at this rocket. This is a sounding rocket called Javelin. This was developed to study the upper atmosphere, more specifically the ionosphere, and um, the ionization properties of the ionosphere so that uh, the Americans could develop um, radio communication technologies more efficiently. But we will not need that kind of rockets. We'll need much smaller, much low-flying rockets. And Dr. Madlener will tell you more about such kind of rockets and their flight properties. Thank you. <clears throat> so, as you have seen, uh, Sean is very passionate about clouds. Mm. So this is a typical CANSAT. This is not our CANSAT, this is just one CANSAT. It's very small satellites, really as, as big as a can, nothing more. And you can today, with uh, modern microelectronics, you can put something in it that can measure whatever you like. Yeah, I mean, there are so many sensors today uh, just go on the internet and search for Arduino or whatever and you get for 50 bucks you get so much that you can yeah make like 10 concepts anyway so what 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 do we want to do and how do we do it our philosophy at FIR is to keep it simple stupid with or without comma so we use solid rocket engines mainly we are also working on hybrids but they are a little bit more complex so solid rocket engines is what we have used the last nine years, and uh, they are based on something we call candy. Yeah. Actually, you can really eat the ingredients. I wouldn't recommend to eat it uh, in block, but uh, it's sugar, it's uh, salt that you normally put in, in meat so it doesn't get bad, mm, a little bit of charcoal, which is not good for the taste, and um, iron oxide, which is more healthy. Anyway. Uh, we use always common materials, so we use aluminum, we use steel, we use multiplex wood, we use PVC, whatever. You don't need something exotic like magnesium, aluminum, whatever. Yeah, it's not necessary. Sometimes we use also glass fiber. Carbon fiber is nice, but it's very difficult to handle. It's bad for your lungs and uh, it's very expensive, so we don't do that. We use standard manufacturing techniques, so milling, drilling, the lath, turning, these are allowed. And we always use a low budget. So none of our rockets is more expensive, let's say, two kilo euro. Yeah, this is, this is our budget for one rocket. Of course, a lot of money goes into all this running around, going to Denmark or wherever, but the rocket itself, it's very cheap. And to keep the budget even lower, we build them to be reusable. So parachutes. Okay, so what have we done in the last years? This is from 2005, it's called Arguna 1. It was a nice little rocket, three meters long, 16 centimeters diameter, so like this. And it could fly to almost one kilometer. <clears throat> and uh, this is a flight in, I think, 2006 or seven. Mm, this is pure candy, as you can see from the white smoke. This is soda, soda powder, essentially. Mm. And you don't see a flame. The so flame is very small because this, this doesn't burn very hot and it has some specific impulse around 140, which is not very good, but it's extremely cheap. Like one kilo costs us like two euros. And in this, on this rocket, it's just two, ki two kilos or so. So ro to, building ro to build rockets and to fly them, that's not the expensive part. The expensive part is to get there and to get the permission to do it. It's more expensive today, at least. So this is the Aguna 2, which was built a year later and was uh, trimmed to be very fast. It has a diameter of only 11 centimeters here, a slightly larger motor, and it get, getting up to about two and a half kilometers with the median motor. The big motor was never used, the big motor. So, so the aft part is the motor. So the, the medium motor is like from here to here, that's all. And the, the big motor, the end motor that we never used would go up to here, yeah? And we did never use it because it hadn't the permission to go up to six, seven kilometers. That's the only problem we had at the time. Anyway, we flew it a few times. This is also, again, a normal candy, as you can see from the white smoke. Uh, then we built, in 2008, the Aguna 3, which is 
not very much larger, but very much thicker. As you can see, this is 20 centimeters diameter, so you can pack a lot of stuff inside it. Yeah, because we, 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 we understood that with the Arguna 2, which was very fast, it was very difficult to put anything inside. Well, at the time we had no Arduinos. Mm, now it's not a problem anymore. Anyway, in flight it's slightly different because this here is what we call suka, super candy, which is a mixture. Yeah, it's not my invention. It's the invention of Dr. Oeckel, which has a patent on it. He's a member of our club. And the patent is just to, to protect it so no one can, can take it away, so everybody can use it. It's essentially candy with a lot of aluminum powder, you know, like 200 micron powder, and it goes really, it has like 170 seconds specific impulse, so it's a lot of more power behind it. Okay, so in 2008, 2009, we thought about, okay, now we build free rockets, but we want to go higher, like 10 kilometers or so. And uh, we had contact with a uh, Danish club called the Danish Space Challenge that operate from a uh, little, little town close to our house. And uh, then we had a motor. I, we will see it later in action. Here, this, this section here, this is the motor. This upper section was a recovery section here, upwards is the avionics bay. We made it shorter after that. This here is the ramp that we built for Poland, but then Poland was so dry that we couldn't go. This was in 2011. They, they called us like one week before, we were ready, we wanted to go to Poland. And they said, no, you can come. Yeah, why not? Yeah, it hasn't rained in like four weeks, and your rocket will, will ignite our wood. So, sorry, sorry guys, next year maybe. Anyway. So let's talk about part production. I have told you that we use normal manufacturing methods, so this is a lath. And after a while, it looks like this. Yeah, so this is uh, for the motor, the upper compartment, the adapter. And these are the parts, the couplers, and um, for the avionics bay, the separation coupler. So these are the normal couplers for the, for the tubes, and this here is for the motor. They were manufactured in 2010. And then we had to make holes in it. I mean, you take a drill, you make holes in it, right? But you have to be very precise. That's not very easy. So what you see here is a stepping motor, which you can give impulses so it turns a certain angle. Otherwise, it will be imprecise. You cannot do it by hand. It's impossible. Again, milling, milling, milling. This takes a lot of time. So to mill a fin like this, it takes like four or five hours. This is the nozzle combined with the enclosure. So here you see the graphite part. Graphite is really very, very nice to, to handle. Of course, it's brittle, but uh, it's uh, self-smearing, so you don't have to use any lubricant during the procedures. And this is a nozzle from, from um, the other side, so you can see here the throat of the nozzle where the hot gases go through. And don't touch this after a test, it's really hot. So, let's talk about our launch campaign in 2014. Our colleagues from DSC uh, had uh, the courtesy to bring us over our materials that we left there, uh, the Aguna 4 parts, because we had to come from Cologne and Berlin and, and Munich and so on and go all the way up to Denmark. So taking the whole rocket every time up and down uh, appeared a little bit futile. So we left the rocket in 2013 there and they told us, no problem, we will bring it by. And that's what they brought us on Monday, and we were scheduled to launch on Saturday, okay? So we were like, oops, what do we do now? But the Danish Space Challenge is up for a challenge, so Danish Soldering Challenge. They really, within, within a few hours, they could repair it by soldering. This is Dural, this is not very easy, it's very brittle material. They soldered it using, using nitrogen gas together again. Of course, we were a little bit uh, astonished that Dural could break so easily, so we removed all the paintings and then used fiberglass to reinforce it again. So we were there for one week before the launch. We came there on, on a Sunday. On Monday, we were brought all the stuff from DSC, Modulo the Fin, <laughs> and then we started to integrate. So we integrated for a whole week this rocket. This was one step. This is the avionics bay, the upper avionics bay. We can see here on the upper, there's antenna. This is just for testing. The real antenna would be more on top. 
This is an RFM 12BP module from Hope RF. Half a watt at 70 centimeters, very powerful. Here below, there are sensors, uh, gyroscopes and accelerometers, and here below is a data processing unit, a simple microcontroller, a PHX32A, if somebody wants to know. So, this is another view from upwards. So you can see again here the power module, the RF power module. This is just a voltage regulator, and this was the antenna for the tests. So this is during integration. So these are just two simple lipos. Yeah? It's very simple, you just put them on top. And what you can see here is some cables running down to an ADC down at the data processing unit because we tried to launch this rocket like three times and every time something else happened. The first time, the batteries ran out on us. So we had it on the ramp, everything was ready and then no telemetry came we said, what, what happened? And it was just that the, the, the battery died on us. It was the first time in Tarnum, in the north part of, of, of Denmark. The second time, this, the, the, the Danes switched the place where they wanted to launch to Nemindegap, which is in the southern part of Denmark. And there is very, very fine sand, white fine sand. And indeed, there is a location very close to Nemindegap, which is called Videsande, which is white sands, if anybody knows what that is. So, we, we tried to launch on white sands, but then they got with their truck on this white sand and it just sank boop, into the sand and they had to call a crane to get it out again. So no launch at this day. Anyway, so this is after integration and you can see the look in their eyes. Finally, it's done. Yeah, it was like several hours. This is on the beach, again, the very fine sand. Here on the left, our meteorologist. Here on the right, the other ones. And on the beach, you really have to work inside a tent because you cannot, you cannot work in the wind and in the sand. Everything gets full of sand. I mean, the sand is really strange. You get full of it, like everything is full of it, and then you go off the, the beach, you make like this, and it's gone. Yeah? It's so fine that it goes into everything, especially into your mechanical parts and lubrication. This is the antenna. This is a circularly polarized antenna, very nice for 70 centimeters. We had two of them. This is one ground station. So we receive telemetry over this antenna, it goes directly to the laptop, and you can see the stream in real time. So these are the three parts. Again, the tip here, avionics parts with telemetry and uh, the recovery part, which is a CO2 cartridge, which is ejected at, at the highest point, or should have been ejected at the highest point. This is the motor. Hey, I come to this. <laughs> this is the motor with the 18 kilograms of sukkah giving about 1.2 tons of thrust for about three seconds, which gives the rocket an acceleration at burnout of about 30 G. So it's fast, yeah? You count to three, it's gone. I mean, literally gone. And this is the recovery section with the parachutes and of course, as we are over sea, a buoy, or better said, there were two buoys, but only one worked. Anyway, <clears throat> this is the launch. So it's very impressive, and I want to show you on video, just have to start it up. First of all, oh no, first I, first I show you the motor. This was a test performed in 2009, where we were just thinking about the Aguna 4. So there was a test that didn't work out in 2008, so this is a setup, very simple. If you look at it, you can find everything in your normal hardware store, except maybe the graphite nozzle. That's very difficult to get, but anyway. So this is Dr. Oeckel. If you look closely, he's missing one finger on his right hand. And yeah, he says he will never again touch chlorates, never. <laughs> yeah, he, he works for this, he, he lives for this. So. He was, he, he's a chemistry, chemist by, by profession, and he worked for, as director of the Bayern Chemie in Sun, so he, he knows what he does. Yeah? But even professionals can get sometimes yeah, well, mutilated, and he's also a slightly deaf on one ear. So. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's why I always say, please stop doing solid rockets. <laughs> but nobody can stop this man. So we are in a field, I think it's somewhere in Bavaria, I, I don't remember exactly. C can we get sound on this? I think so. Yeah? 
Put a little louder. One moment, I try. Where is this mode at there, no? Right here, yeah. Pop. <laughs> Wait and see. This sukkah is very slow, and that's, uh, we have a reason why it's so slow. We tested it at BUM. It has this BUM certification, which is, in, in German we say, without BUM, no BUM, okay? <laughs> this is very important. You are not allowed to use such pyrotechnics without uh, proper registration and everything. So, Dr. Oeckel has... Uh, the certificate to manufacture that kind of stuff. And of course, as I said, he had problems with chlorates, so he switched to nitrates, and nitrates are also very volatile. So they tested this motor and they found out that the sucker is extremely sturdy. That is, you can go at it with a hammer. You take it, the piece of, of uh, sucker, you take a hammer and you can really club it. Don't try this with uh, any combustible rocket fuel, yeah? But this one is really, really very slow. That's why it takes so long until it gets started. You really need the motor to build up the pressure until it goes, and when it goes, I'll tell ya. Okay, so, first of all, I will show you the... This is a test of the ejection system of the recovery system, so it will put out the parachute. So this is in real time. It will be slightly fast. So I will stop it when it's out. So that was it. Yeah? So this happens in mid-air in the highest point. It just ejects through CO2. And what we see here, well, this is avionics, and here connected to a shock band and a carabine. This is a... Um, a drogue chute from a drone called CL289, which is very cheap, like 10 euro, but it's of the best material, it's aramid. And here, down here, you have the buoy, the one that got destroyed, but one buoy, another one is, is in, the, in the lower section. So there is one shock band that goes down to the lower section, and at a proper time, or height, to be more precise, at 400 meters, a second pyro resolves a junction down there so the main chute can get out the second buoy. So, and this can be shown also in slow motion so you can really appreciate what's happening there. Please look for the CO2 snow. I think I have to... This is really slow. It takes a lot of time. I think this is a Casio FX1, I don't know, I don't remember. Just to the end. Now, okay? So this is what happens in slow motion. We made a lot of tests and this was what, very, very spectacular during daytime. We did some tests during nighttime. So this is the launch itself. This is slow motion. I tell you, this is slow motion. This is like half the speed of the real rocket. Bye bye. In reality, it's like, where did it go? Well, it was very funny this day because we had, we had at the beginning, we had blue skies, really nice weather, and then the clouds came. And then our Danish friends from Danish Space Shuttle, they had also a rocket, a little smaller one. Not too small, but not that fast. And it went into the cloud. And in the cloud, something happened, like boom. And then on the same trajectory, the rocket fell down. Like, <laughs> so as if the cloud would have munched it up or something. And then this one got up, and we got nice telemetry. But it went down, and we never found it again. At that day. At that day. So we were a little sad, but we had the telemetry. So we were glad and sad at the same moment. Glad because finally we could launch the rocket and this is sad because we couldn't take it home. But two days ago, uh, later, when we were there on, on a Sunday, thinking about nothing, a mail came in and said, look what the cat dragged in. 
And there our rocket was again. It had survived with one buoy. And, and it was in, in Danish newspapers, everything, rocket uh, found at whatever site, and we don't know where it comes from, and who. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but the chairman of DSC, he's a journalist, no problem. His press release was flawless, flawless. Anyway, so that's what we have been doing now. We, we will try to, to refit the Arguna 4, which is now in Denmark, using a dart to go even higher. This one reached 6.5 kilometers. I could show you all the telemetry, but it's not really very interesting. It takes a lot of time, but if somebody's interested, please ask. Mm. And this will be our next rocket. Okay, there, there are no lengths, but this is like the same length as the Arguna 4, like 4.5 meters, but like 30 centimeters diameter or so, 20 to 30 centimeters. It's called the Arguna 5, and we have already a mock-up. Not a fly-in version in the sense that it will go like 50 kilometers high, but a mock-up that will go up to about two kilometers, just to test everything, aerodynamics and so on. Okay, so that's for today. Please, if you have questions. David and Sean, thank you very much for this very, very impressive uh, speech. So now we have question and answers. We have 10 minutes. So please line up behind the microphones. We have three over here and three over here. Um, while you're lining up, um, is there any questions from the IRC? Yes? Yeah, there are. Um, one question was, are there any restrictions or on height or the size of a rocket that you can launch on your backyard or anything? Or are you restricted and it is forbidden? Are there any restrictions? Well, <laughs> how can I put this? Mm, we are in Germany. <laughs> Actually, we have been trying to uh, launch rockets from a military ground since 2006, which is now, let me see, well, wait, eight years. And they granted it as on 8th of December of this year to launch two rockets. So we launched rockets in Baumholder. You may have been reading it, otherwise Google it. Baumholder FIR, you will find it. And yes, there are a lot of restrictions. We had 31 restrictions to launch in a military place. So think about launching it in your backyard. <laughs> of course, if you go to Denmark, It's a totally different matter. They just ask you, is this a rocket? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And don't leave the space. Okay. <laughs> so it's much, much, much easier. But of course, the bigger the rockets get, I mean, the rockets you just show, one, two, and three, they are really model rockets. I mean, they, they look like big rockets, but they only fly up to 2.5 kilometers. This is still a model rocket, yeah? Aguna 4 is something totally different. I remember this Danish woman standing there, first having watched their own rocket, and then the second one, the Aguna 4, and she just said, without thinking, wow, that's a real rocket. <laughs> <laughs> That made me very happy. Anyway, <laughs> did this, quest this question fully answer? Yeah? Okay, thank you, David. Um, gentleman on number two, please. Okay. First, you uh, asked in the beginning for, for further reasons to go to space, and I um, came up with one, actually, because we may need to earlier or rather hopefully later. But um, my real question is um, some technical details about the rocket. You mentioned it, uh, right now it's rather a model rocket, and it doesn't really go to space yet. Um, and I'm wondering, Yeah, what the next steps are, especially because I guess you will not get into space with sugar alone. Well, we don't want to, but there are people, there's a project called Sugar Shot to Space, SS2S. <laughs> they really try it, but they have a problem because candy, this is sugar, uh, propellant has one drawback. It's eatable, but it has one drawback. Uh, it's brittle. So if you make large grains, let about 12 centimeters diameter starts, the problem starts, that when you start up the engine and the pressure peak comes up, 
then some of the grains may break. And if a grain breaks, that means that the area, the burning area, will vary very fast, which will produce a pressure spike, which will make a faster reaction, which will produce more pressure, will, you guess it. <laughs> okay, the next question is, uh, you mentioned um, the price, uh, 2,000 euros, and I wondered what um, the maximum weight is you can transport up to, well, what? Arguna uh, 4, you mentioned, will go 10 kilometers high. What's the payload you can transport there? Yeah, we, we, are, we are aiming for... Uh, the thing is, the, the rocket is really, really heavy now. We make it that heavy because we cannot go that high. So the last time we had 30,000 feet, which is approximately 9.1 kilometers of ceiling. So we, we, we didn't want to make a, a very agile rocket, very, very high-going rocket. Yeah, so we were happy that it stayed below seven kilometers. Yes, you have to have some margin, otherwise they don't believe you that you really, yeah, you know. Anyway, um, we could transport like five kilos or so at the moment. Of course, there's not enough space unless you put in steel or something. So something like two kilograms is more realistic. Yeah, that's totally enough for a lot of avionics. Okay, and my last question is about testing. Um, it's quite difficult to test the software which goes high there If, if it uh, is expected to experience uh, in excess of what, 40 Gs of acceleration, I guess you do not test this in the lab before. Well, yes, you can test it. <laughs> it has more than 40 Gs when it hits the ground. Try it. Okay, but it's not... Uh, <laughs> okay, Prob probably. <laughs> okay, David, thank you. Uh, gentleman at number one, please. Yes. Um, in Kerbal Space Program, I learned you need some kind of control for the rocket so it doesn't veer off. Did I miss that part, or can you explain how you control how the steuerung of the rocket functioniert? Uh, yeah, Co control, control. Well, we would like to control it. The problem is that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> As I said, keep it simple, stupid. So at the moment, no control. Of course, the rocket is stable, yeah? so it doesn't go anywhere we don't want it to, but it's, it's, it's passively controlled on its trajectory. So you once put the ramp up and you aim for the direction, and that's it. And because they accelerate so fast, they are immediately stable. Yeah? The, the, the momentum um, cord is like half a meter, so there is absolutely no motion. It's like straight arrow. And, of course, we would like to control it, but what's the point at the moment? At the moment, there's no point, because we have, we have solid rocket motors that burn out in three seconds. So after that, what do you want to control? No, no motor burning anymore. It's another thing if you have hybrids, which accelerate with like only 2G or, or even lower, then your rocket is totally unstable and you need control. And there's no way around it. So what we will do is take this very nice O motor, propel it to 30 Gs up to 1.7 Mach, and then put a little dart on top with a little hybrid motor, so it's stable. Yeah? So we can go up to 10 to 20 kilometers without new technology, or almost no new technology. Yeah? Great. Thank you. Number two, please. Um, you maintained that there are laws in Germany, uh, you said, without BAM, no boom or something. Yeah. Um, if you build hybrid motors, um, are there restrictions too? Or how does it work in Germany? Psst. There are no restrictions. Psst. <laughs> yes! <laughs> Any Anything from IRC? Okay, um, number two, please. I've seen people uh, using balloons to do measurements. That sounds a lot cheaper and easier. It's a lot less spectacular, but why aren't you using them? <laughs> That's the point. That's the point. It's less spectacular. <laughs> number one, number one. <laughs> uh, the, the thing is, of course, balloons are very easy to get like to 30 to 40 kilometers of height. That's true. And if you really want to just go up to this height, use balloons. It's okay. The thing is, don't expect it to come back. 
number one, or it's really difficult to get it back. Okay, rockets are sometimes also difficult to locate, I know. Uh, we have lost some of them, or, or more, but we always found them in the end, like a few weeks later or so. <laughs> so balloons are a nice thing and we wanted to do it, but we just hadn't had the time, it's all. You can use balloons, no problem at all. Yeah, but don't expect to go to 100 kilometers, not possible. Yeah, in, in the long run, yeah? but balloons are a nice thing. Unless you want to launch rockets from balloons, which I don't recommend. <laughs> okay, number one, please. Once you get the sensors up to the height that you want, you're only going to get, if you don't have anything to keep them there, one or two seconds at most of readings. Can you comment on how sure. you get you readings? Need, you need to have a sensor that is fast enough with a sample rate of, let's say, 10 hertz or so. Then you will have in this two or three seconds, like 20 to 30 data points. What do you need more? I mean, how long do you want to stay up there? Take a balloon if you want to stay up there longer. <laughs> It's a valid point. The thing, is, the thing is, using a rocket, you get a profile, an almost instantaneous profile of all the measurable observables from the ground to the top, fast. With a balloon, you take several minutes to half an hour to get through all of this. And you get it twice, up and down. Yeah, sure. Well, there's one more thing. Um, the delivery of the device is very, very precise. So if you have a particular cloud layer, for example, you want to investigate, then you will not use a balloon because the crosswinds may drive the balloon somewhere else, somewhere far away from your cloud or somewhere far away from your Hollywood zone. You'll use a rocket which will directly deliver your device where you want it to be. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Number two, please. Yes, if, uh, if you use GPS with your rocket, uh, does, it, uh, does it actually maintain a lock on the signal? Huh. Oh. <laughs> That's a real problem. With the Arguna 4, I didn't tell you. Um, the thing is that the Arguna 4 was a full metal jacket, so no GPS receiving. And it went up to 6.5 kilometers, and we anticipated to go up to like 7.5-ish, but it didn't because the drag was higher than anticipated, but that's why you do the flight, right? You don't know everything. Aerodynamics is really complicated, especially with such a strange rocket. It's a very, very strange ratio of length to diameter. And um, so the GPS receiver was inside this full metal jacket, so no signal at all. And our idea was, while it comes down, we'll find a fix, because we had calculated it had three minutes to get a fix. Okay, in theory. The problem was that when it opened, it opened like 10 seconds too late, because somehow, we don't know why, the avionics, two avionics computer did not detect the highest point. This is a software problem. We are not responsible because this stuff was bought, okay? So <laughs> it was the only, the only equipment that was not made in-house, okay? And it failed. So we have learned that lessons. We will make our own avionics the next time. Anyway, it fell like for 10 seconds, and you can imagine if you let something fall for 10 seconds, it has like 360 kilometers per hour, and then it opened, like you saw there, in mid-air, and the parachute, the drogue chute, was especially designed for such a case. Otherwise, it would have just ripped into a thousand pieces. So it just ripped at one point. <laughs> <laughs> and the rocket fell faster than expected, so after 120 seconds of full telemetry and the first fix showing up, because we saw the time, it fell into the water. So we had no data. But in principle, if you put on a fiberglass red dome from the beginning, what we do next time, then you will get to fix at least during the time he recovers from this very fast ascent, because of course this is beyond the parameters of normal GPS systems. There are people that have uh, a pimped up GPS system. Maybe sitting here in the room? Yeah? yeah? If, if somebody thinks about this, come to us. Really interesting device. Okay, thank you. Some question from IRC? Yeah, there was another question. What are your problems or points against using uh, uh, the balloons instead of the rockets? No, no, no. I have no points against using balloons instead of rockets. They are just totally different. The one is very pointy, and the one is very round, and the one goes very fast, and the other very slow. <laughs> yeah. I have only one problem, launching rockets from balloons, because pointy and round, no good, okay? 
Okay, three more questions. So we start over there, number one. Um, you spoke about sensors. Uh, maybe I didn't get it, but uh, could you please uh, explain a little bit more about the sensors you're using and what do you do with the data? And maybe you can especially comment on uh, whether you thought about plugging a camera on your rocket. What was the last part? A, um, a camera. Yeah, on, yeah, on we rocket. had a camera. It was lost. Uh, it, it was lost during integration, it's worse, it's worse. We had the camera there. <laughs> we had the space there in the Vionics Bay and uh, we don't know exactly what happened. Somehow the USB connector got loose and it was destroyed. We, we, we tried everything to revive it, but it was dead and we couldn't get a new one because it was... Do you have a film of that? Hmm? Do you have a movie of that? Of the destruction <laughs> of the from camera. the camera. <laughs> so that the camera filmed until its end. So. No, 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 no. Before the launch, during integration, the camera was destroyed by integrating it. <laughs> so we now know that we need a backup camera, okay? <laughs> okay, no, but, but the question of the sensors is, is of course, um, interesting. Uh, we use inertial measurement sensors, which are totally common nowadays. Uh, you can buy them like 10 degree, 10 degree of freedom sensor boards on the internet for like 15 euros, where you have um, a gyroscope with uh, all three axes, uh, the accelerometer <clears throat> and uh, the barometer. And we also use the module which goes up to 24G on all three axes, additionally. Uh, so you can, you can follow the trajectory of, of the rocket. And this was what was on board. And of course, the most important thing for the height is the barometric sensor, which was a BMA 180 of Bosch, which has calibration on board and everything, very nice temperature compensation and extremely cheap, so there, there are other sensors too, but they are so dead cheap today, it's just uh, no comparison to like 10 years ago, where you really had to make a bridge and a very high, sophisticated 24-bit AD or whatever, yeah? It's very, very cheap today. So we had just trajectory measurements, so inertia measurements and the pressure, and we wanted to do also measurements of the temperature on the tip, but that didn't work out because we had a problem with the antenna. We had to change it, so there was no temperature sensor on the tip because there would, you would have the stagnation temperature. And from that, you can also deduce the speed of the rocket relative to the atmosphere. Yeah? So these are the typical observables that we used at the beginning. And of course, later on, we want to use more meteorolo meteorological observables. An, an. <laughs> So you are um, storing the data of that sensors uh, on site, or what? Luckily we didn't, otherwise we wouldn't have had one byte. Um, no, we, we sent it directly to the stream downwards on 70 centimeter band. It's not a lot of bandwidth, that's why we don't have too much data. It's like, uh, like 30 kilohertz or so on bandwidth. And we send just uh, NMAR sentences downwards. So like the GPS sentence, you just get an ADC sentence and an EMU sentence and so on, and just stored uh, um, on two separate locations, on two laptops, in real time. And of course, we have also an SD card on board where it is streamed on, but if the SD card is lost, it's lost. No, that's the problem. So you can reproduce every launch you do with yep. the data. Uh, sorry, we're running out of time, so one very short last question, and then we have to close it here. Right. I have a short, a short question uh, regarding propellant. Um, uh, some years ago, I read about Alice propellant consisting of ice, water ice, and aluminum powder. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us something about it? Yeah, sure. It's water and aluminum. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's very fine aluminum, and... Uh, the principle with, 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 with sugar, as sugar, and uh, this Alice is almost the same because, as you know, carbohydrate is just a carbon skeleton with a lot of water around it. So what you do is that the water burns aluminum, well, and the carbon also takes a little bit of the water, and then you have CO2, aluminum oxide, corrond, and a little bit of, of sodium, uh, sodium carbonate. And the thing with Alice is that it's really difficult to store. So unless you go to the Arctic or Antarctic, not so practical, yeah, because it has to be frozen. Then it's a nice propellant. Yeah, I, I read a lot about it because it has a very high specific impulse and it's, it's almost inert during handling, so it's very nice, but uh, it has to be cold, really cold. And this was like spring in Denmark, it's warm. Okay, thank yeah. you. 
Uh, David and Sean, thank you very much for this very impressive uh, speech. A round of applause. Thank you.